He's an author and a speaker. He served our country and suffered a traumatic accident where he died on the operating table twice and was told he was never going to walk again. He's here with us, full of life and mobility. It's time for a conversation with Marcus Aurelius Anderson. So Marcus one, welcome to the show. Definitely proud and honored. Thank you for your service to our country. Let's start with a little backstory though and tell us about your childhood, where you grew up. Give us, give us a little bit of your, your history as a childhood. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, childhood for me grew up in Oklahoma. Parents were divorced when I was younger. I was about eight or nine when they were divorced. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma is where I spent most of my life growing up. Uh, moved to a smaller city with my mom after there was a divorce. But from there, just went to high school, went to uh, junior college, wasn't really sure where I wanted to do next. And then that's when I initially moved to Kansas City to start doing some um, study of chiropractic, the chiropractic arts. And that was what really kind of got me to understand a little bit more about the human body, the interaction of that. And I like that whole holistic idea of how the mind and the body is connected, the kind of above, down, inside out mentality. From Which will definitely carry us full circle in a second, that's it, for sure. It really will, for better or for worse. But yeah, it was, it was incredible. Um, Kansas City is a great place. I eventually moved to Atlanta because the, the chiropractic school there was one that was more to my liking. Philosophically, it was much more, um, resonated with me a lot more. Uh, unfortunately, I lost a lot of my credits from going to Kansas City to there, but it's an investment, right? So I'm not afraid to take one step back if I can take multiple steps forward. And then going through that was when I uh, got married and I was about a year and a half uh, away from my doctorate before I really started uh, starting to have some things happen in my life. So what led you to want to get into the military and serve our country? Yes, so I was married and I was uh, taking a lot of, about 25 hours of doctorate level courses in, in school, and then I was bartending about 40 hours a week. So there wasn't a lot of sleep there. And I was newly married and what happened was I, I prioritized the wrong things. We talk about priorities and everybody has priorities whether they have them on a list that says priorities or not. In my mind, I was doing the right thing by preparing us for what we wanted to do after married, kids, practice, etc. But what I did was I didn't focus on the most important thing, which is that relationship. And that relationship fell, fell apart. My great uncle, uh, I call him uncle, but he was my great uncle, great uncle Ronnie. He was one of the most pivotal men in my life. Outside of my father, he was the biggest role model that I ever had. And when I was growing up, when my parents were divorced, he was the big male role model for me. And my father and everybody else in the family had a tremendous role, of respect for him. He was in Special Forces, he was in Vietnam, he, was, he had spent 20 years in the Army, and everything that he said when it talked about work ethic and, and honor and integrity and humility, all those things really, really resonated with me, with what my father taught me, even with what I was being taught in the martial arts at a young age. And I say all that because not long after the divorce, he passed away. So. The first thing, the divorce kind of took me down to brass tacks to make me kind of re-examine what was going on because a lot of what I was doing was based on that. But then after he passed, it really, really set me on my, my tail. At the funeral, I was a pallbearer and I was pretty strong and pretty stoic at the time, but then when they started playing taps and all these people had come up and talked about him mm. and all of his you know, accolades and 21 gun salute and a full bird colonel coming to eulogize him and then seeing them full up the flag and then give it to my, my great aunt, um, you know, it just, it just crushed me. But not long after that, the following week, I'd, I'd known that I'd always wanted to join the military, and I was 38 at this time. So we always have excuses in our life for what we want to do. But now, I, like I'm divorced, I don't have any kids, I can push pause on my education. If I'm going to do it, my window is now. So that's when I decided to go down to uh, talk to the recruiter and see if there was any way that I could get into the Army. and. Uh, that's interesting as well. The, at 38, you walk in and I ask him, what's the window? And he says, 35. So I immediately turn and he says, well, come back and talk to me. And I'm very straightforward. And I say, if this isn't going to happen, then don't waste my time. Right. And he says, well, let's just talk and see what's going on. He asked me about my motivation. And uh, it was what I just discussed earlier. So he said, oh, okay. And then he says, so uh, are you smart? And I said, I don't know, I'm talking to a recruiter at 38 years old, so I don't know, you tell me if I'm smart. Gave me an ASVAB placement test, passed it with flying colors, asked me if I was physically strong, did a, a PT test there, I maxed it out. 
So he said, okay, you're 38, you're a natural leader, you're in great shape, and your test scores are off the chart. You're exactly what the Army is looking for. So I'm excited about that. And he went through and told me all of these different jobs that I could have a choice for because in the Army, if you're qualified, you can choose what you decide to do. And he showed me all these, these jobs with, you know, with um, all this technology and Internet security and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, so what do you want to do? And I said, the infantry. Wow. Was he expecting that? Uh, he was not, and he, he <laughs> kind of slowed down, spoke Wait a little a bit louder. He's like, over here. you don't understand that. You could be doing anything. And he wanted to look at my psyche valve a little bit more, I guess. But I, I made him understand. He, said, he says, you don't get it. He said, you can do whatever you want. And I said, you don't get it. This is what I want. And if I can't have this, then I'll just walk out and I'll take another path. And we went back and forth for a little while, and finally he said, you know, this is your life. And he signed the release to let me get in at 38, slid it over, I signed it off, and then uh, six months later, I'm getting off the bus at, at Fort Benning, getting yelled at. So. Well, but what's interesting is, I mean, you're so close to getting your doctorate in this direction in life, and right. then all of a sudden, complete detour, and, and not a, I mean, most of them are 18 when they sign up, and they go yeah. that path at 18, very young, and to your point, you're coming in at 38 saying, hey, I wanna make this life choice, and not take the easy route, I wanna go in and be an infantryman. That's it. And th that's what made them. The thing, too, was the intention was I could go, I could still serve my country, um, you know, sort of follow that legacy. And then after I do that for four or eight years or whatever it is, I can come back and now I can finish my doctorate and feel like I've actually done what I needed to do to fulfill that obligation in my mind. But having said that, th that's what happens in life. There's what we hope happens, there's what we are afraid of happens, and then there's what happens. So being there and getting off the bus and getting yelled at by people that are younger than me and competing against guys that are half my age, that was, it sounds crazy, but that's what I needed. I, I was saying, that's probably what you wanted. I mean, you knew I, what you're, at, at 38, you know what you're getting into. I did, so you're kind of like, I want to go this route. That's what it was, and I really trained hard leading up to it because when you had that deadline, it really, really gives you a lot of intent, intent with your purpose and what you're trying to get done. So the biggest fear was that I was going to get injured because there were younger guys around me breaking their ankles, dislocating their shoulders, hurting their hips because of all the impact. But because I had done my sort of due diligence and I had prepared myself, that allowed me to be able to sort of carry over. And the advantage that I had was that I had 38 years of experience living life as opposed to just being a person who's, you know, if you're 18 years old and you never lived away from home and you never have been away from your cell phone, that's a big tra traumatic change for you. And it's really hard for you to really wrap your head around it and then you're thrust into this environment where things are... Um, adverse at times. Was it easy for you though? I mean, at 38, you're established, you're successful, you've almost got your doctorate over here, you've got people yelling at you now, trying to break you down mentally. That's gotta be a little bit tough, right? If, if I were to have resisted it mentally, it would have been, but martial arts keeps you humble, and I went in with the intention understanding that, listen, I'm a complete new, newbie to this, and while I may understand combat with hand-to-hand -hand stuff, I do not understand military combat. I do not understand how the chain of command goes. Good point. So as far as I'm concerned, even if it's a 19, like my first squad leader was 19 years old initially. So that's the first thing he asked me when he did like a, a council with me. He's like, do you have a problem taking orders from me? I said, no, because you know this territory much more than I do. You've been deployed. You understand this a lot more than I do. If you're a person who didn't know anything and you're just being disrespectful, that's different. But the nice thing was when you give respect and you can show that you can follow, that's when they give you opportunity to lead. So if you're able to do that, the more that I can learn, the better I can understand that. And then that gave me pockets where my experience and, and knowledge kind of set into it perfectly. So once I understood the way things were, I was able to dovetail with that pretty well. So you're getting ready to be deployed and then this accident happens. So talk about, talk about the accident, talk about kind of give us, give us the picture that ultimately was this massive pivotal moment in your life. So. When you're preparing to deploy, what they did was they pushed our deployment back. And whenever you have additional time to train to deploy in the military, you never slow down. You actually click it up as much as you can because you can never be prepared enough. There's always areas, there's always ex expertise that you need. So leading up to that, they were really pushing us and the, in the intense training, whether it be you know, going for runs when you have 100 pounds on your back and you're doing it in the snow and the ice and you have 50 pounds of plate armor and you've got your helmet and your weapon system and you're wearing a gas mask. That's sort of crazy, but it has to be because if you're going to deploy in Afghanistan, you have to have that knowledge and you have to know what you're capable of because if you don't prepare yourself, that's when other people die. So that's why it's so important. 
Having said that, the week leading up to it, I had, had a little bit of trouble with my hands and my feet in a numbness arena, but for me, I thought, just thought it was because of the cold. But as the week progressed, I started getting more and more trouble, having a hard enough time with even trying to put on my uniform or tie my boots. And that's why I knew that there was something going on, but I just said, you know what, I'm just gonna get some sleep and tomorrow's gonna be better. But for me, what happened was I woke up that morning and I want to roll out of bed and my neck would articulate, but the rest of my body would not move. So as we talked about with the, uh, the pre-frame with uh, the chiropractic school, I know that there's something going on and at first I sort of chuckle because I'm like, ah, oh, the 38 year old guy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm for, almost 40 at that time. You know, my body's sore from all the training. And I actually thought to myself, well, I'm gonna have to do some working out this weekend to kind of catch up, you know, do some squats and deadlifts so that I'm not like that. But as I continued to try to move and nothing was happening, now that chiropractor comes in in my mind and is saying, we know that this is a neurological issue, this is something traumatic, this is something big, and this is something that you're not gonna be able to just walk off, as it were. Luckily for me, there was somebody that was gonna be beating on my door in the morning anyway. So when they knocked on the door, um, I yelled through and tell them what's going on. And then it was a mad dash to the hospital thereafter. So that was uh, a big surprise because I was expecting to be able to get up and do everything I would normally. And it turned out to be a, a day that changed my life forever. So share because you, you die on the operating table twice and then you get the diagnosis, you're not gonna be able to, to walk again, you're not gonna be able to move your hands again. So, so share kind of that side of this is dying on the operating table. Give us some, cause that's, that's crazy. It, it was pretty crazy. The, and it's just like in a movie, for better or for worse, I'm on a gurney, they're running in with me. There's an army of people basically there with you. They're poking and prodding you. They're shining lights in your eyes. They're talking about you like you're not there. And they ran me down to get an MRI. It turns out a disc in my neck had ruptured. And when a disc ruptures in your neck, if it's traumatic enough, it actually pushes into your spinal cord and it keeps the spinal cord from being able to communicate with everything else that's going on. So almost like a hose, the water will flow, but if you step on it, it doesn't. So that disc was compressing my spinal cord and causing a lot of neurological damage. So they say, listen, we're gonna go in there, we're gonna remove all that, and then we're gonna put some metal in your neck, we're gonna get it all stabilized. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, you're removing the obstruction, so I should be able to walk, right? And then it's quiet. And everybody's like, well, let's just get through the surgery first. Let's not worry about that. And of course that makes me nervous and makes me angry because nobody's gonna give me a straight answer. But I also understand in hindsight that that's not their job. Their job is to take care of this traumatic, this trauma right now, get him through it, and then the other stuff will happen as it happens. So I don't really have any kind of choice at that point. They just put the anesthesia on me and I start counting down from 100. When I wake up in the ICU, uh, I'm still paralyzed, I'm in a neck brace, so what little mobility I had is, is gone. And the uh, doctor comes in and sits at the foot of the table and he says, well, you had us worried for a little bit, we lost you. And I'm thinking, how do you lose me, I'm right here. And he said, no, 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 you, you were gone, you flatlined on us a couple of times. They had to do a lot of work to get me back, which obviously I'm grateful for. And he says, the good news, Mr. Anderson, is you get to live it tail to tail. And he was very congratulatory in that but the bad news is this is what you're left with and you're gonna be like this for the rest of your life. And that's when, uh, that was one of my lowest points probably right there. Because you have an expert telling you what you think are your boundaries now in the sense that you're, you're gonna be left with this sort of life. Right. That's all you know. Yeah. <sighs> Process that because I mean, in almost a blink of an eye, you've gone from mm -hmm. someone who gave up this life to serve our country to then all of a sudden is, is dying on the table twice and now being given a diagnosis, you're not gonna be able to move. Your life has dramatically changed yes. and now you've got this diagnosis where you don't necessarily have any hope. It, and that's what it was. The, I asked him, I said, is there any possibility? He says, if you're gonna walk, it would happen like today or tomorrow because removing that obstruction should allow you to have that kind of communication. But I understand the central nervous system the spinal cord is very, very delicate. It's like pieces of silk that are strung together. It only takes 10 millimeters of mercury of pressure to compress that, which is the weight of a dime. So when you take in consideration that the human disc in our neck has got the sort of texture and strength of a hockey puck, and then that's being pressed down upon that, it only makes sense that that's, that would be what they believed. 
so for me, of course, I'm a soldier. I'm in denial. I'm like, well, if I overcame death, I should be able to overcome this. And I just tell myself I'm going to be better tomorrow. Well, I said that for about seven days. And then after a week of being in there and things aren't improving, and they, when they took me out of the ICU and put me back into my unit to convalesce, that's when it became really real because now I realized that I couldn't just put my fingers on my ears and act like this wasn't going on. Right. I had to face this. This and isn't a movie. It's, this is life. This now. is real. And that's when it was the hardest because now you, like you said, I contributed everything in my existence to this. That My whole idea was to go serve my country. And then to have that kind of taken away from you. Because uh, as people, a lot of times for us it's based on our vocation is a direct reflection of our capacity, our capability. So again, as a soldier, going, doing almost like these superhuman things, and then going to a point where I can't even take care of myself, that was a huge slap. And I've always been very physical. So waking up in a bed, turning 40 years old in a bed, unable to move, broken, divorced, that's one of the lowest points I could ever be at in my life. And understanding that this is what I was left with, that's when I really had to do a lot of brutal, deep soul searching to figure out. And it, it gave me a lot of time to think, and it actually made me very angry. Um, the anger I projected to people around me, and I'll, I'll own up to that. But the person I was the most angry at was myself, because I realized now that I had all these opportunities that I'd wasted. I had all this time that I'd wasted. I had all this talent that I just assumed that I would always have. People say you don't know what you got till it's gone, but the reality is we know what we have, but we just assume that we will always have it. Mm -hmm. And in this life, that's not how it works. So if you love somebody, if you're wanting to do something with your life, if you're wanting to do, start a business, whatever it is, stop waiting, stop hesitating, stop compromising, and start acting. Because we don't know what's gonna happen. All we have is this moment. And so we have to have that sort of urgency with, with whatever we do. So for me, laying in that bed, looking over my life and realizing, man, I could have done so much more. It, it was really a big slap in the face that really got my attention. When did it flip? When did you start looking at that as the gift of adversity? It was a gift. It, it took me three months of being just living. I was angry at myself and everyone around me, like I said, but what really changed was I finally woke up one morning after about three months and I realized, okay, this anger isn't helping me. It's not serving me. It doesn't do anything other than inhibit my ability to cope with this. So what I had to find is I had to find something to offset all that anger. And for most people, that is love. But for me, in that place where I was at, I really didn't have a whole lot of that. So if people look at something like unconditional love, you can think of somebody that you love unconditionally. If they do something that you don't like or you don't agree with, you're still going to love them because that's what love is. For me, I had to find something opposite of, of anger, and for me, it was gratitude but it was unconditional gratitude. Gratitude is a big buzzword and I understand everybody does it now, but I would say from my experience, most of the people that are saying that they're grateful are doing it half-heartedly at best because it's easy to be grateful for our life when we're making money and our family's health, healthy and, and, every, and, the, and the weather's beautiful, right? But when the shoe's on the other foot and adversity comes to pay a visit, now it's much harder. And that's what a lot of people are doing. In this life, we cannot just cherry pick the things that we like and be grateful only for those things because that's not what gratitude is. That's not how it works. You have to learn to be grateful for everything in your life, the good and the bad. Because if you can learn to be just as grateful for winning the lottery as you are for the person who cut you off in traffic, if you can see that all as opportunity, now you're bulletproof. Now you have that genuine, unadulterated, gratitude and that's what really changes your life. If you can do that, that's what makes you understand everything. So now the good things you're even more grateful for and the not so good things are opportunities to learn. They show you where your weaknesses are. They shine a light on your inadequacies and they also help you better appreciate the good things that you have. So for me, I had to find gratitude. But when you're laying in a bed like that, there's not a lot to be grateful for. So what I had to do is I, I felt like the universe or God had punished me. I thought it was because of something I'd done. This isn't fair. You know, I was playing the victim. And that's what a lot of people do. When they go through adversity, it's, it's 
blame, it's the victim, it's yes. anger, it's frustration. So to flip that on its head, that's a that's a paradigm shift. It it really is, and and that's what happened when I was just thinking about me. It was hard for me to see anything, but when I took myself out of the equation, that's when it changed for me because. I said, okay, did anybody benefit from me being injured? And that's when I realized that in my mind, this injury was, a, it was an inevitability, it was going to happen. So whether I'd be in Afghanistan or whether I'd be domestic, it was gonna happen. So if I'd have been deployed, for every one man who was injured, it takes two men to pull into safety. So most teams are six people, so that means now my team is compromised, which means the squad is compromised, they would have to cover down. Now the Chinook helicopter that would have to fly into a hot zone would be put in harm's way. Everybody on that Chinook are in harm's way as well. And when I did that, I was able to itemize and check off. I was like, there's over a dozen other people whose lives would have been in harm's way if I'd have been deployed. And for the first time in three months, I was just like, wow, I'm, I'm lucky. And when I said it, like I couldn't even believe I was saying it. I broke down, I was genuinely grateful, genuine, unadulterated gratitude. Once I had that, once I started seeing the adversity as a gift instead of a curse, a week after I made that middle shift, I started getting a little bit of feeling back into my hand. Wow. So the only thing that changed between then and the other three months was the way I was thinking about it. And for me, once I had like that little foundation of gratitude, because it only takes one thing, it takes one thought, one decision. And once you have that, now you can build on it if you choose to create momentum with that, if you choose to focus on that. Well, then you have a little bit of sensation, which then gives you hope and then says, wait a second, That's this it. can be so much bigger, so much more, so much more powerful. It can. But even then, I had the idea of if I only get this, I'm still better off than what I was. So I was even grateful for that because there were times within my recovery where it went back and forth. There was actually a time where I, uh, I kind of had a little bit of arrogance. I was like, see, I knew I could do it. And when I did that, I went almost back to square one. Wow. So for me, and again, I went through the whole cycle again of anger, you know, but then I realized, wait, wait, wait. This is what worked before. I have to get myself back in that place, and I'm never going to allow myself to exercise hubris again. And by doing that, again, it was a long road, but I was able to continue to move forward. And so now I just carry that with me every day. I, I stay tethered to adversity because it keeps me really, really cognizant of where I am, where I've gone, and where I need to be going with it. So that keeps me really, really present in what I'm trying to accomplish. Well, and let's talk about present day because, I mean, obviously you're here today. Uh, you are moving and, and, and doing all sorts of uh, crazy activities in, a, in an amazing way, but you're sharing this platform and this story to inspire others. And so that is the book. You're out speaking. Share a little bit today about just, you know, where you are mobility-wise, which is really cool, but also, too, just the book and, and your goal of using this as a gift for others. Absolutely. So I'm, I am recovered. I, I still have um, some nerve damage in my hands and my feet. I still have neuropathy, they call it, from the, about the middle of my hands, middle of my forearms to my hands and the middle of my shins to my feet. But uh, even then, like I say, I'm grateful for that because that reminds me of where I came from. And using the book, using uh, the TEDx talk, being offered that opportunity, being able to speak to people, I felt really compelled to do this because I, I was kind of quiet about it first because people would hear about the story and either they were blown away or they just they couldn't believe that something like that so powerful could happen. And then I realized that if I learn something and I can give it to somebody else, that's still my responsibility. And that's the way I look at it. So what do you hope that people draw from the book in terms of maybe one or two lessons? The biggest lesson is I think people underestimate themselves tremendously. They have no idea what they're capable of. And the reason why they don't is because they shy away from adversity. Adversity strengthens us if we're willing to see that. Adversity is our best teacher. And the reality is we are only as strong as the adversity that we overcome. So if you're trying to get stronger physically and you never pick up a weight, how can you possibly expect to get stronger? And if you lift the same weight every day, how do you expect to get stronger? You have to continually push that up. They call weightlifting resistance training. You're literally conditioning yourself to resist. You do that mentally as well. We go through all those different things. And Doing it with the body is usually the easiest because it's really difficult for us to deny it at the time. With mentality, we can kind of get in our own heads and we can play a game and we can uh, make deals with ourselves or whatever, but that's the idea is to go through and understand that you are much stronger than you realize, so act within that potential, but also understand that 
there's something I call the adversity scale. So the hardest thing you've ever done in your life is at 10. And then the best day of your life is zero, like heaven on earth. And this is a way to keep everybody sort of objective. So if you're going through a hard day, it's a Monday and the traffic's bad and it's bad weather and you spill your coffee and you're like, man, this day sucks. Be real honest and ask yourself, okay, on the grand scheme of things, on my scale of zero to 10, where is this? Usually it's about a three, maybe a four. And by doing that, that takes your emotion out of it because emotions assassinate the truth. So by doing that, you can look at it incredibly objectively and now you can say, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, I'm, I'm doing all right. Plus, if you see that and you say, listen, we're at about a three, that means there are seven more clicks that you could go up to be able to really start applying yourself. So that's something that's pragmatic and practical that people can add. People talk about looking for gratitude and writing them down. I, I, I'm very big on gratitude, but what I have a lot of people do is when they brush their teeth at night, uh, instead of being talking about the things they're grateful for, I ask them to think about one thing that day that they overcame, one adversity that they faced and they overcame. So that could be for a person who's depressed just getting out of bed. That could be for a single mom just being able to take care of her family. That could be for a, a family man to be able to come home and be present for his kids instead of just turning on the TV or getting on his phone and ignoring his family. These are things that we can apply and it starts with that small step. And before you know it, you start building momentum within that. And again, this is something that is very pragmatic and you can start applying. It's simple, it's not easy, but if you can have that idea now before you get to it, it will serve you in a thousand arenas. Well, thank you for using your gift of adversity to help and inspire others. And thank you everyone for watching A Conversation with Marcus Aruas Anderson.